Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I realise it's not 7 o'clock yet, so we cannot actually start on the agenda, but I can do the introduction because that doesn't count. <laughs> and good evening and welcome to the Woking Borough Council Planning Committee. And so a few points before we start. We have a PA system, mobile phones should be off or on silent, and there is no planned fire drill tonight. The proceedings are filmed and will be available on the Woking Borough website. You will see from the camera position that the committee members, council officers and registered speakers will normally be recorded, that speakers may ask not to be filmed, that their comments will be audio recorded. The planning committee is made up of nine elected members. I'll just ask them to introduce themselves one by one, starting on my far right, the councillor Rock. Angus Ross, representing Working Without Ward. Wayne Smith, representing Hurst. Michelle Shepherd Bay, representing Wayne. Malcolm Richards, representing Norwich within town, Working with Town. Chris Barry, Evidence Walking, Working Town, and Vice Chairman. Tim Holton from Horton, Lower Early and Chair. Uh, John Jarvis representing Twyford. And I'm Carl Doran representing Bullmush and Whitegates. Thank you very much, members. We are supported and advised by a variety of professional council officers. I'll now ask them to introduce themselves, starting on my far right. I'm Wyatt Clark, the committee. Mary Severin, advising um, legal, on legal matters. Marcia Head, Service Manager, Development Management. Judy Kelly, Highways Development Manager. Thank you very, thank you very much. Planning officers presenting tonight's uh, application are sat on my far left, and I will introduce them at the um, appropriate time. Angus, I just noticed that button, so I don't know if it's affecting the. <laughs> Okay, I'll not to worry then. Thank you. Yeah, the bottom light is not on. Okay, thank you. This is a quasi judicial committee with formal set procedures and conduct. Firstly, the planning officer will present each application. I will then call in turn only those who are pre registered to speak. Please come forward to the table. The microphone is controlled by the grey button on the base. The time limit, three minutes for each category of speaker, will be strictly enforced. So please ensure you get your key points across within your allotted time. Members of the committee are interested in the quality of what you have to say and not for how long you speak. Following the planning officer's presentation and the comments of registered speakers, the planning committee members will consider, question and seek clarification for the application and hopefully reach a decision which may or may not agree with the planning officer's recommendation. Finally, a reminder that the local planning authority's role is to determine any valid planning application using local and national planning policy. Our role is not to suggest alterations to schemes, whether they are a good idea or needed, whether they are too costly or whether there are alternative uses. Thank you very much. And now as we are past seven o'clock, I can start on the agenda. And the first item is apologies. Apologies submitted from Councillor Bill Simon. Thank you very much. And does anyone need to declare an interest? No. Okay. Are there any applications to be uh, deferred or withdrawn? No. All right. So it's full agenda then tonight. Minutes, Chairman. Oh, minutes. I have get the minutes. I do apologise. Are there any um, alterations to those minutes? from last month. <coughs> All those in favour then please. Thank you very much. Okay. First application then. <coughs> Agenda item 81 on page 13. It's uh, Brooks, Brook House and Reading Powerhouse at uh, Molly Miller's Lane in Wokingham. A full application for a change of use from mixed use to Sue's Generous who's B1C, B2, B8, to include extension to Brook House, installation of solar panels, two silos, parking, and demolition of the Ready Power building. It's before the committee tonight, as it's a major application. I shall hand over to the case officer, Simon Taylor. Um, the error map on the screen shows the location of Brook House and Ready Power House. 
sorry, Brook House and Ready Power House. Uh, Ready Power House is proposed to be demolished um, and replaced with a, a 17 metre high extension to the rear of Brook House. Um, it'll result in a net increase of 2,350 square metres um, to the rear of Brook House uh, to be used for accommodation of B1 offices, B2 uh, general industrial, B8 storage and distribution. Um, it forms part of the wider intersurgical site. This building here is the existing head office of intersurgical. Um, they undertake respiratory um, apparatus for hospitals mainly. There's also a storage unit used mostly for storage and distribution here. Um, <coughs> They're currently employing over 400 um, existing um, staff members in the uh, immediate area, in the working area. Uh, it involves a net incre an increase of Class B floor space, so the principle of development is acceptable. Um, it also involves the addition of 25 additional staff, um, so it meets policy CP. Um, uh, PCP 12. There's 58 additional car parking spaces, therefore uh, satisfying the parking requirements of the wider, um, wider, wider site. There's existing parking in this area here for the surgical. There's also some ad hoc parking in this area around here. The proposal here shows the additional parking in green, uh, the existing parking in red. Uh, just of note, this, this is Anbrook. Uh, flying through the site in the middle here. Um, excuse me. Neighbour amenity um, is one issue that was raised during the report. Um, Oakey Drive residences of these properties along the, the boundary here, separated by the Crowthorn uh, railway line between the two sites. Um, the primary concern from the development being the height of the development um, above the railway line. This line here is the approximate height of the railway line. Um, this building here is the existing Brook House, and these buildings here are the height of the, the new extension. Um, that would be evidenced <coughs> in some photos taken from Oakey Drive here. So you will see the building through the trees here. It's also in um, this photo taken from Carnival Car Park. Um, you see the properties in the drive here and the extension will be approximately in this area here. Um, of note, the officer report does refer to a few other properties, uh, buildings in the surrounding area. This being in the background here, the um, an existing five-storey building on Molly Miller's Drive, which has been converted for residential properties. So that has been used as a comparison in terms of what kind of heights you're looking at in the area. Um, other conditions in the recommendation include conditions relating to um, contamination of the site, uh, remediation of the site, um, provision of motorcycle parking and cycle parking, and disabled parking to meet the requirements of the, the local plan. Um, I'll go back to the photos here. You can see uh, the existing car parking and, and brought through the site. A lot of the site is in flood zone two and three. Um, the use of the, the, develop, the, the site use um, is a low vulnerable use, so um, the extension to the building in this area here is acceptable. There are flood mitigation measures to protect against it. There are no objections re received from neighbouring properties, um, no submission received from the uh, Working Town Council. The members update. Uh, proposes a few um, minor modifications to the conditions that are incidental to the overall um, application. Um, application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Right, we have one registered speaker, which is Emily Temple, the agent. If you'd like to come forward. <coughs> Good evening, councillors. If you might need to press the button, just so it makes a difference. Okay. 
I'm pleased to support the application this evening for the expansion of Intersurgical's business in Wokingham. As members may know, Intersurgical is the second largest employer in Wokingham after only the council. The business has been located on the Molly Miller Corps employment area for over 20 years and is world renowned for the manufacture of medical respiratory equipment that is used in private clinics and hospitals worldwide. The company do have premises in Lithuania, but they are proud to have their headquarters here in Wokingham. With the NHS being one of Intersurgical's largest clients, the ability to manufacture and deliver medical equipment within the UK is of paramount importance and the demand for such products is rapidly increasing as the NHS is almost wholly reliant on Intersurgical's products, such as these respiratory masks and tubing. By way of context, the company manufactures 2 million of these per month and 100,000 of these per month <coughs> in the existing facilities available. So the expansion of the Wokingham facility is a fundamental part of responding to the NHS's growing need. The proposal before you this evening seeks to replace an existing plant hire business building, redeveloping a previously developed site and vacant site adjacent to the company's existing buildings. The scheme includes ample parking provision, and given that most of the building will be occupied by large machines rather than high numbers of extra staff, although there will be some additional employment and apprenticeships that can result as from this development. A suite of environmental and technical reports are also included in the application to address matters such as drainage and contamination and to control future landscaping and the visual appearance of the building. We note officers recommended conditions and a request for a legal agreement and we can confirm agreement to both of these requirements. So I hope this evening you are reassured by my comments we trust we've worked well with your planning officers to date and request that your officers' positive response is supported in your decision this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. We can go to the ward member to speak first. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I just quote um, paragraph 12, which refers to paragraph 80 of the MPPA. It says the decision should help create the conditions in which businesses can invest in and expand and adapt. A significant weight should be placed on the need to support economic growth, productivity, taking into account both local business needs and wider opportunities for development. I think this is an excellent application which does precisely what is required. And as I hear something from the members, <coughs> any adverse comments from members, I should be open to support it. <coughs> Angus? <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. I've got no, um, no principal objections at all. <coughs> I noticed in the update uh, one of the changes to conditions is number is on doors, uh, which is numbered in our update as 23, but in the original agenda was number 24. I think maybe this is an error there. My, the other thing is my question. Uh, has an employment skill plan morphed into being a project community liaison group? Sorry, I didn't realize has it morphed into a... In the update, it's an employment... Um, it's a... Uh, where is it? Um, project community liaison group. Uh, the employment skills plan uh, condition was deleted because it was um, a duplicate because it's included in the section 96 agreement. Um, condition, the condition for community liaison is a, a new condition which has been added um, in its place, so there's no connection between the two. And you see the number change error? That's noted and it will be rectified. Just a, a very general question, would this uh, development in any way prejudice the possibility of a footpath along the Embrook, which I know some people have been looking to provide? I just don't, I don't know whether that was considered. It wasn't, but it's not part of this application, but I'd like to know if, if it would in any way preclude having a footpath uh, along the length of the Embrook in this particular part. Uh, there's no works on the immediate boundary. I'm aware of uh, future plans to provide connectivity through the site, so this doesn't actually affect it in any way. I'll just refer back to the plans. Um, <coughs> this is at the end, Brook here. Um, I'm not exactly sure which side of the, the um, 
stream that's on, but there's space on either side to revive it. Wayne? Yeah, my point, Simon, is just for clarification. In the uh, page 26, where it talks about neighbours, no comments, but then it goes on to um, an error in validation. You make reference that there were no neighbour comments. The point you were making on Oakley Drive, was that just for our background? You weren't pointing us to anything in terms of neighbour objections. You were just giving us some background information. Were you? That's correct. Um, I, I merely know that the height of the building is, is above everything around it um, and giving some context of, of how it related to the surrounding neighbourhood. So, can I? Yeah, please do. So, we've had no, no comments, negative or positive, from the town council, neighbours, blah, blah, blah. They're all happy. There's been, no, there's been no comments to date, but I should add the recommendation you'll note um, on page 14 uh, requires uh, the deferral and delegation final decision. That's following the conclusion of the um, notification period, which uh, extends to the 28th of March. That arose through a, a validation error um, it was only picked up at a late stage. The members update does make a note of um, there's been no submissions in the first 13 of the 28 days that it's been notified. Okay, thank you. Malcolm? And then Carl. Uh, yes, I've never of this. <coughs> it comes in for some time, never in a, a negative light. I can't find any reason to object to the application. The description is quite good. Uh, it's an opportunity to modernise and expand. And in making the products in this country, and I think manufacturing here is quite uh, an issue for me. I have absolutely no objection. I will be voting in favour. Thank you, Carl and Michelle. <coughs> um, just to reiterate what we also saying, really, we've, we've got a um, long standing local law manufacturing company, and we'd be crazy to do anything to kind of reduce that, really, in the present climate, certainly. But uh, a couple of things I just want to ask questions on, really. Um, additional HGV delivery movements outside, it says in paragraph 32, or page 32. Well, later on, page 36, it talks about the design and access statement talking about a maximum of four HGV deliveries per day at the regular intervals, uh, and they could arrive during the night. And it would not be appropriate to limit delivery times by condition. So, I'd like to ask why. Um, all I'm worried about really is I can see that this, the kind of noise mitigation stuff for the building itself, the closed doors, that all sounds like it would work quite well. Um, but obviously if, if there's HGVs outside, doors opening, pot lifts running around in the middle of the night, is that happening at the moment? Uh, if it is, is that, I'll tell you that's not a problem already obviously, but um, is this a massive amount of additional delivery movements, etc.? That's the first thing. And the second point I'd like to make is on the eastern elevation diagram, one that's going to be peering right over the railway line and its homes in Oki. Those windows there, where's the floor in relation to those windows? Just wondering whether they're at height that someone could actually, um, is that a corridor somebody could walk past or is it the top of a large machine floor or something? Those windows would be along this elevation. Um, there's a void in that area. Okay. There's a void in this area here. Um, those windows will be at that level there. So I'm guessing that height is probably 1.5 metres or so above um, floor level. Um, more to the point, the separation distance between these to properties um, is in excess of 40 metres, so it wasn't considered an issue. Yeah, I'm just, just thinking, you know, we, we spent a long time kind of looking at, you know, opaque windows for a house that's next to another one, and there's a 17 metre high industrial building that will definitely have people in it walking around at night. So I, I take it if it's a void, I mean, it looks like that, that to me, it looks like kind of the top illumination for a a large working area, so it's, it's not really going to be people stood around peering through it, but I just, just want to ask the question. Um, 
I'll just add to that, this area is class B8, use and storage and distribution, so the, the employment level up there is fairly low. Right, cool. Right, just the, what I'm saying, could you just come back on the HGV, please? Uh, the design and access statement made reference to four um, movements a day. They, they said about, so there's no um, set amount of movements in a day. I've made the assumption that there's likely to be additional movements. Um, the movements come from Lithuania, so they are at any time of the day, they'll, they'll arrive. So in that respect, it was considered to be onerous to limit it, especially when there was, as council records indicate, there's been no previous um, complaints made against the issue of noise from movements. Um, I visited the site in late afternoons, so and there were movements of forklifts, um, we were reversing sounds from that, but there was no delivery movements. Um, this application um, would likely bring some additional movements, but it wasn't felt that it should be conditioned to protect that. Okay, thanks all. Michelle? I do appreciate the idea of having more uh, jobs in the area. Also, in having medical supplies here, especially the EDC of Brexit coming, we may have to have the medical supplies. Having uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. um, looked through the drawings and that, I, it, it appears to me that this is a, um, a very good opportunity for the uh, local local business to improve. And it must be, oh, I, I'd like to record, congratulate them on, on Intersurgical, a fairly large company. And they do deal with the world, but it's dead, apparently, from what the young lady was saying. Uh, I can't see anything wrong with it, and I would support this application. So I do have a question there for the highways. Can you tell me how many of the car parking spaces are going to be affected by flooding and what how regular? Um, I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. There's 14, uh, sorry, we'll go to the car park plan. There's 14 spaces in this area here that are in flood zone 3B, which is a one in uh, 20 year flood event. Um, there are existing spaces. Um, there's signage condition. As part of the flood risk assessment, there's the condition requiring compliance with that, and that requires sign basing of, of that area there. Um, there's also an early warning system Environment agency, so it's felt that cars will be able to uh, leave the site without being affected by flood levels by the time that happens. Okay. Right, members, if there are no more questions, no more questions. No. right. So the recommendation then, the recommendation is out on page 14, and remember that on the members update as well, where it says that. Um, if we're to approve this, it is subject to a final decision by the Assistant Director of the Place-Based Services. That is just in case there's anything coming from the um, from the consultation that's taking place at the moment, which is finishes at the end of the month. So there's a number of changes on the members' update for the conditions, and numbered the doors <coughs> 23 has been renumbered in the members update to 24 it should be. All those in favour of the application please show and that is unanimous. Thank you members. The next item then is 82 on page 75, which is the day centre at South Lake Crescent Woodley. So, a full application for 10 three bedroom semi detached houses. There are affordable dwellings. Before the committee, it's a major application, and the applicant is Woking and Housing Limited. All committee members went on the site visit on Friday. I will now hand over to Simon Taylor, the case officer. Thank you, Chair. The application involves a construction of five seven attached buildings in this site here. Um, so 10 dwellings within five built seven attached buildings, apologies. Um, the, the site was previously operated as a uh, working borough council day centre.
providing respite for dementia sufferers um, and a few other um, aged facilities. Um, the surrounding area is characterised by a fairly uniform and symmetrical building design. Um, the dwellings themselves <coughs> are fairly symmetrical, um, semi-detached buildings um, on large this is evidence of the type of development in the area. And they provide a large, deep plots. The proposal seeks to provide 10 <coughs> dwellings in, in symmetrical form. All five buildings are the same floor layout, um, three bedroom dwellings, except for two dwellings up here, which don't include bay windows. Um, it includes off street car parking for two spaces for each property, um, and low level landscaping to the front boundary. Uh, the rear garden there, you've got cycle storage and bin storage in this area here, and then in this area for these dwellings. The primary concerns that were raised were the, the symmetrical nature of the development and how it related to the surrounding area in terms of building width. Um, that was felt to be met in terms of how it related to um, achieving some, some consistency with the build form. It also, uh, some concern was raised with respect to the, what I termed in the report a pinch point in this area here, with the depth of the uh, rear garden areas all do meet 11 metres. In this area here they do become slightly narrow. Um, there's conditioning in terms of boundary treatments to lower the fence height to 1.5 metres and 300 mils above that to be trellis to provide maximising, uh, to maximise the amount of sunlight into these areas. Um, it also uh, has been designed to provide the bin storage and cyber storage in areas that are less used. Um, you'll also note, looking at the site plan here, that there is in excess of 22 metres uh, from every point to the um, corresponding properties. So there's no issue of amenity, neighbour amenity uh, within the development or indeed across the boundaries within the South Lake present. Um, there have been two submissions from neighbouring properties uh, in the area. They relate to the provision of, um, sorry, the provision of parking on site, loss of the parking bay, which is shown <coughs> in this uh, photograph, uh, traffic management um, with respect to um, dealing with uh, the, additional, the, the additional movements associated with the church as well, which adjoins the site. Um, and access and visibility displays. Um, the proposal was acceptable to the highways officer um, in terms of visibility displays, landscaping, and the number of driveways in the street does open up the visibility in the site. This parking bay here is also proposed to be replaced with an additional parking bay for three parking spaces in this area here. That forms part of the condition of the recommendation. Um, There's also conditions relating to the provision of materials, construction management plan, footpath, construction, which will be uh, provided. Uh, you'll note here at the moment there, there is no footpath on this side of the road, so that is an improvement to, to, to pedestrian facilities. Um, there's also biodiversity um, requirements. P permitted development rights have been removed because of the, the issue of the, the the depth of the garden areas, so any extensions might uh, begin to intrude on any of those neighbour issues. Um, as part of the members update, there are minor changes to conditions just in terms of commencement of works, uh, except for the provision of the employment skills plan has been included as part of this recommendation. Um, and there is some modifications to condition 21 relating to the provision of the skill glazing to first floor windows. Um, just on a side note, I just felt it was slightly onerous uh, to impose that condition in this area here to this window here because it um, didn't overlook in every case. Um, application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have three people registered to speak, and the first one is David Bragg, Woodley Town Council. Good evening. Thank you. Press this button. Uh, good evening. 
I'm Councillor David Wright from Woodley Town Council Planning Committee, and we re um, recommended refusal of this application for the reasons that you actually had in your um, agenda. That was on the agenda. But let me first start by saying that we want to see this land developed, but we've got great concerns about this particular land mainly over the parking. Um, ideally, we would like to see communal parking on that development. Um, on page 95 of the agenda in front of you, um, paragraph 59 actually highlights the fact that there's no restriction on street parking in uh, Satellite Crescent, and that there's 130 metres of street frontage allowing parking for an excess of 10 vehicles. This fails, however, to highlight the fact that most of this available space is already utilised by the existing residents. And then in front of you, you only exacerbate this, um, these issues. The width of the road is also concerning. Um, insofar as you, paragraph 59 states, it's 4.8 to 5.5 metres in width. But remember, please, modern cars have a width of about 1.85 centimetres, and many have wing mirrors that extend up to 0.4 metres <coughs> in total either side. So on 4.8 metres, and it is the narrowest part of South Lake Crescent, it's difficult for two cars to pass in safety without considering emergency vehicles, records, orders, etc. The current plan uh, consists of 10 houses, each with their own access onto the road, and tandem parking for two vehicles. Now, again, you've got an average turning circle in a mid-range car of 34 feet. So that means if there's any car parked in that road, when those residents want to enter their driveway or exit, it's going to be a task to get into their driveways and particularly reversing that. Um, that in itself will increase the risk factor of the collision, particularly on the bend, which is a blind spot. Um, from that, I would suggest that um, Section 8.3.23 of the Manual for uh, Streets Act, detailed in paragraph 61, is actually negated by these circumstances. Um, I'd also remind this committee that other than taking a 20 minute um, bus journey around Woodley, it's not possible for the residents of South Lake Crescent to get to Woodley Precinct other than by foot or by car. Um, and that, I think, would actually increase the demand for unallocated or visible parking as people come back from the shops. If you could wind up now, you've had your three minutes. I've got two. 15 seconds. Um, in circumstances, a preferred site for community parking for the uh, residents and visitors, even though it, we appreciate it may result in a reduction in the number of properties. Um, one further item, in the event this committee deems it right to approve this plan, can we recommend for safety's sake that consideration be given in South Lake Crescent being made one way in the circular route around the Crescent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next person we have speaking then is Martin Few, the architect. <coughs> okay, welcome to you, sir. <coughs> So there should be the yeah. light should be on the grey button. Yeah, great. Um, so we've uh, obviously we're employed by Working Housing to, to take the uh, initial feasibility works with the um, the view of developing the site as it was no longer going to be taken forward as an age concern site. Um, we then uh, undertook several options which uh, we took forward for pre-application with uh, the case officer. Uh, 
of Simon. Uh, feedback was received and we and, undertook various uh, tweaks and changes to accommodate <coughs> those aspects whilst retaining the spatial standards and social requirements required for the funding for my clients. Um, we have obviously undertaken a public consultation where the feedback was uh, fundamentally around the parking and the roadways and access, which completely understand. Um, we've also looked at whether we could um, drop the speed in the street and things like that, and uh, uh, the previous gentleman saying about the one-way system that was discussed as well. So we've, we have looked at those out items, but the, they are out of our control. We have offered um, at the parking provision of the lay-by off-site, which um, was a, a good thing to do. Um, the parking at the moment is in accordance with the um, planning policies and as the case has, uh, has stated, the uh, design, uh, layout, massing, um, scope is in accordance with the street setting and the policies. Uh, that's, that's really it. Thank you very much for Final wish to speak then is Councillor Abdul Lois, who's the board member. Welcome to Abdul. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Chairman, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in support of this application. Oh, could you just press the button so we can hear? Thank you. Thank you. Woodley is no different than anywhere else in the need to have more affordable housing. The addition of this 10 semi detached house is welcome addition to the housing stock. I note that community consultation was overly positive, which is consistent with what residents have been telling me on the doorsteps. However, there has been few comments about parking issue and I welcome this inclusion of condition 13, which require the applicant to provide the placement parking there for three cars on the eastern side of South Lake, South Lake Crescent. To address this issue, I especially like the fact that the new parking bay has to be built before the commencement of this development, as a true indication that council has taken into consideration resident concern on this matter. Therefore, I hope the planning committee will approve this application and provide those extra affordable homes that would be desperately need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, before I open it up to members, I'm just going to come back to the, the officers on some of those questions that were posed, in particular by Broadley Town Council. Um, so firstly, it was on the car parking, the level of car parking, and access to the driveways in case cars are parked close to the edge of that. The width of the road being 4.8. Possibility of having a one-way system. And the final question, the um, access to the precinct, how far away it actually is. Thank you. Um, so in terms of parking, uh, the application does meet the parking standards in terms of it's got two spaces per three bed dwelling, plus it's providing the three space laid by uh, the new parking off street, um, which um, meets the requirement for one unallocated space and two visitor spaces generated by this site. Um, I think we saw from site visit that there is spare capacity on the street in terms of the parking base at their moment. Um, so whilst there might be some inconsiderate parking in future related to this site in terms of parking on the highway, um, it's probably no, not very different to what's going on at the moment. Um, I don't think it cause um, some highway harm. Um, the fact that there's 10 new vehicle access is coming out onto the highway as well, it's going to protect and sort of sterilise that area of the highway. So people are going to park along that narrow 4.8 metre wide um, sort of um, semi circular section of road. Um, I'd say also the provision of the 2 metre wide footway is going to improve the, the form of visibility around the bend here. Because if you remember from site visit, there was that hoarding that tried to get to the edge of the carriageway. Um, if you think about that being set back 2 metres, and then the vegetation of the front garden is being quite low as well, that's, that, that should improve matters. Um, 4.8 is deemed acceptable for uh, a road width to get two vehicles past each other. Um, in Quiet sort of cul de sacs, we do go down to 4.1 metres on occasion, um, and it is quite a, a quiet um, sort of 
location in terms of um, traffic past the site. Um, I think. So what one way would that be beyond the scope of this application? It would be, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think we would have to look at, there would be all sorts of interconnectivity with the right of way to a little bit further to the site and the wider area. And it's, it's not something that would be, that would stand up appeal, as in, they must implement a one-way system, otherwise we would have to refuse this and we wouldn't be able to justify that sort of um, measure on the highway. Did you want to just come back on that point, Chris? Good question. Uh, that would be another grounding condition, would it? Is it possible? What's that, sorry? That would be a grounding condition, another one, For to make way. it one way. Because uh, it's out of the WHL yes, exactly. yes, yeah. yeah. You, you dismiss that. I don't think it's justified. Yeah, it's given the development. Mm -hmm. Then since on the distance to the precinct. Uh, I presume when you refer to the precinct, it's the Woodley Town Centre. Yes, so paragraph nine refers to that 750 metres to Woodley Town Centre. Um, it's also in 400 metres of, of several bus stops along Collins Moor Road. And so that is not Collins Moor Road. That main road there is another road up here. So it's within easy walking distance of several bus stops. Can I just come back as well on the um, all my systems? So obviously, the previous use of the site was a daycare centre with um, a certain level of parking and staff and visitor numbers and so on. So, in terms of the difference in trip generations, it's not that similar. So, that would okay. be another reason why I couldn't support it. Right. Rochelle, then Wayne. I'd like to commend uh, the idea of actually spending a portal housing money on building new affordable homes. It hasn't been the case in a lot of places when the affordable money was available. I also like the idea of actually having two spaces per dwelling, which is something I would like to see in our, in our design guide to make absolutely sure we don't have the problems we already have in almost every single new estate. Thank you for those positive comments. Michelle, <coughs> Wayne. We keep the positive theme going. No, I, I, I think I would say if I was one of those neighbours for that 2.8 whatever metre fence that's there, this is going to be a welcome change. But I think the point to add on the hedge, on the site visit sign, you said the hedge was going to be maintained quite low. Did you say about 600 mil high? Correct. Right. Well, and also we have in the power to, because it's within our control, to keep this um, management of this this area, um, our, our course affordable housing, we won't have control over all of it, but we will have control over 70% of it. And <clears throat> I think that, you know, this is no different to any other site. So I think if we're starting to introduce things like one-way systems, you know, this isn't dissimilar. And on the morning we were there, um, I think I only saw one other car in the whole of this semicircle. and. That was yours. You were the first one there. The rest were parked somewhere else. So there was only one car there. So, and I think it's quite an easy access to if you want to walk to the shops. I think it would take you about seven or eight minutes, or five minutes to the bus stops. I think this is a great scheme. Malcolm, then Carl. I certainly welcome uh, the provision of additional affordable housing. Uh, obviously, it looks to be a much better scheme than what is there at the moment. Uh, very little traffic when we were there, so um, I have no problem doing that. I think it's an admirable scheme. I'm <coughs> in favour. Carl? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> as everybody knows, affordable housing is my welfare. 100%. This is the point where I normally say, should we do better? Um, mathematically, no. Can't do that. No. So that's fine. Uh, and I'd have to work really hard to find something wrong with that. Uh, but I do, and I did. Um, so I have found something that's slightly like that. It's just a minor point, but I'm going to make it. Um, in the core strategy, policy CP5, paragraph 4.32, talks about the affordable housing viability study, saying the council, uh, a, a provision of affordable housing is based on a 70-30 split between social rent and shared ownership. And it says the council will use this split as the starting point for negotiations on affordable housing. Then it talks about applying flexibility and so on. Um, just want to make the point that this is the council dealing with the council here. And you know, when we come here, we have developers trying to get away with you know a lot less affordable housing than this, shall we say? 
then it, I think it's worth the, the council sticks to what it says it's going to do. And if not, I, I'd like to see why this was only six. It should be seven social and three um, uh, shared ownership according to that. Um, so, yeah, that, that we could do better. So, yeah, nice try. Not quite perfect, but good. A um, couple of other questions. Um, the crime prevention design officer bit where it says he had no objections subject to a condition requiring safer by design details and that was kind of ruled out um, referring to paragraph 55 of the MPPF which is all about conditions that you know, are just a bit over the top and aren't really required. So I'm just interested to know why and uh, that was the case. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about the lack of visibility displays and so on but I take the point that they're within the Specs, otherwise we, we, you wouldn't have allowed it. So um, I'll, I'll go back after it's built and have a look at it. Um, if we say yes to it. Um, the community consultation was overwhelmingly <coughs> positive, and that's the only thing said about it in here. I'd like to have seen some details around that, considering that the town council and a few neighbours objected, and there was not really loads of people saying this is brilliant in terms of the, the, the official representations we're getting so I'd like to have seen a bit about that um, and one question about I think you might have answered it but I'll just clarify it the bit about boundaries and the fences at the back being 1.8 meters high and then a trellis is that is that trellis of 300 meters millimeters on top of the of the 1.8 meter fence or is it 1.8 meter in total um, yeah that's that's everything I've got okay. Simon, uh, in terms of the affordable housing, um, the cost strategy dates from 2010. Um, I, this application has been reviewed by um, our policy officer. Um, I can only presume that this um, deals with the mix or the requirements that have date from today. So it's nine years since the cost strategy was adopted. So figures will change over time. Um, safe by design. Um, the scheme is for 10 dwellings. It, it was felt onerous for the, to apply a condition requiring that um, for this scale of development. Um, it, it doesn't have any unique circumstances that would bring about some um, adverse situations that would promote antisocial behaviour, so that's why that condition wasn't applied. Um, the community consultation, um, it was discussed in the design and access statement. Um, I can't comment beyond that. Um, and the trellis is 300 mils on top of 1.5 metre fence. Um, so 1.8 metre. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's back on the visibility. Um, yeah, just that the, um, there is a, a planning condition. Um, so Details of the visibility space are to be secured um, prior to uh, commencement of this. Um, we maintain and create the main instruction uh, in terms of social. Um, and there's a landscaping commission as well, so those details can be secured. Okay. Michelle? I think it's for the right side for everything. It's a shame Loki couldn't have done this with their site at right. Elmer's Field. Uh, uh, Rochelle, uh, 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 we're talking with this application. Rochelle, please, no. can we stick to this application? Okay. Touch the other part. <laughs> right, are there any more questions, clarifications? So you're happy for me to take it to the vote? Yes. Okay, right, well, the recommendation then is set out on page 76 to grant my admission. These are the set of conditions there in our agenda. And then in the members update, there are quite a number of changes to the conditions. Okay, so we're all clear on that. All those in favor, please show. And thank you, that's unanimous, thank you.
Right, the next item then is agenda item 83 on page 199, 119. It's five actually cottages in Orgrave, a household application for a part single, part two story side rear extension and single story front extension plus a garden room. It's before the committee tonight, it's been listed by Councillor Horsall. Um, there was a site visit back in September 19, uh, 17. Um, I was one of those that went on the site visit, and I do believe several other members went on site as well. I'm now going to do the case also. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yes, this is application 183289, um, which is for a front side and rear extension um, and number five hatch gate cottages, um, and the site is located within the green belt. <coughs> This is the location plan, um, which shows the property within a row of similar properties um, along Hatchgate Lane in Cockpole Green. This is the block plan um, of the proposal. Um, so you can see uh, towards the bottom of the screen a small proposed outbuilding. Um, also, you've got the side and rear extension. I'll just point it out for you uh, just here and here. Um, so you've got the existing elevations of the house. Um, it's a semi-detached property, so it's the one shaded in grey. Um, and here's the here are the proposed elevations um, with the side extension obviously to the side and the two gables to the rear. Um, here are the existing floor plans. Here are the proposed floor plans. So on the top left, you've got the property as it is now. Um, on the bottom right, you've got the attached neighbor um, from the front of their driveway, just to give you some perspective. Um, on the top left, you have the neighbouring property, um, the unattached neighbouring property. So to the right of that image would be the application property. Um, and then on the bottom right, you've got the rear elevation of the application property. Um, here are some images of the street scene, again, to give some perspective. So in the top left image, um, you, you can't see it fully because of the hedge. Um, but the application property is the third um, from the right. Um, and then down at the bottom, you've just got um, Cockpole Green next, next door. Um, and here, again, you've got the rear of the um, application property on the top left, um, the neighboring properties, and then the attached property. So the proposal is with the, within the Green Belt. Um, the MPPF indicates that inappropriate development is harmful to the Green Belt by definition. Extensions to existing buildings should be considered inappropriate unless they do not result in disproportionate additions over and above the size of the original building. Uh, this is supported by policy TV01 of the uh, and, uh, Managing Development Delivery Local Plan, which states that extension should be limited and this is defined as no more than 35 percent increase in volume um, as the officer's report outlines the proposal would result in an increase in volume of approximately 102 percent uh, the proposal follows the refusal of a very similar extension by the committee in september 2017 with a similar increase in volume as has been discussed in the officer report, the applicant has submitted two further applications since the refusal of the previous application on site. This consists of full permission for a side extension, um, which was less than a 35% increase in volume, um, and a certificate of lawfulness confirming the lawfulness of two large, uh, of a large two-story rear extension and several large outbuildings. The applicant has argued that these constitute a valid fallback position and that these would be more harmful to the openness of the green belt than the existing scheme. It should be noted that extensions to the house would not be as large as what is currently proposed and the fallback position relies on living across several outbuildings. 
The weight to be attached to the fullback position is a matter for the decision maker and increases with the likelihood of the position being carried out. As outlined in paragraph 19 of the report, the likelihood of the fullback position being carried out is questioned as permitted development rights have been restricted under the approved side extension, meaning that all permitted development aspects of the fullback position would need to be commenced and completed prior to the com commencement of the, this aspect of the proposal. The practicality of living across several outbuildings is also questioned. Therefore, it's recommended that the weight to be attached to the fallback position is limited, and it's not considered that this consists of the very special circumstances which are required to, clear, um, to clearly outweigh any other material considerations or harms. Um, so for some perspective again, um, at the top is the current scheme proposed and at the bottom is the previous um, scheme that was refused by the committee. I can come back to that. Um, and in terms of the fallback position, um, that's shown here. So up to the side of the dwelling um, here, that's the application that's been approved. Um, and then to the rear of the dwelling, um, you've got a, P, a permitted development rear extension and then num the outbuildings are numbered one and two on there. Um, so to conclude, this application follows the refusal of a similar application. Since then, um, a fallback position has been identified. Um, however, the likelihood of this being implemented is questioned and this is a matter for uh, the decision maker. Uh, the proposal is therefore recommended for refusal. Um, in terms of the members' update, um, the table of figures in the, in paragraph 16 of the officer's report um, were incorrect and these have been amended. Thank you very much. Right, we have two categories of um, speakers for this application. We've got Adrian Gould, the agent, and Chris Copeland, the applicant. Would you like to come forward? Um, just so I'm clear, are you sort of having one and a half minutes each, or how are you splitting it? <coughs> we will be splitting your time in minutes and two minutes. Okay, yep. so I will ask for it to go, they'll go at one minute then. Thank you. I hope you've had the opportunity to read my supporting letter as it identifies the clear planning rationale that exists having regard to local precedent and fallback case law to approve the application. A favourable assessment, however, only really requires the application of common sense. This is on the basis that the ability already exists to erect approved extensions and outbuildings, which would have a tangibly greater greenbelt impact than the current proposal. The plan on display shows this clearly, with the fallback scheme in red on the left-hand side being nearly 10% larger in volume and 20% larger in footprint than the current scheme, which is in green on the right-hand side. Demonstrating less volume is one component required to prove a valid fallback, the other being the likelihood of the fallback scheme actually being implemented. Mr. Cochran will now explain why they want to enlarge the property and why implementing the fallback scheme, if necessary, would still be attractive to them. Thank you. Um, firstly, I'd just like to provide some context and background. Um, we're a family of five. Uh, we've been renting in the village uh, Crazy Sill for the last, uh, for the last four years, and we have three children who attend the local primary school. We purchased the property at auction with the intention of creating a family home. The property has not been extended since it was first built, um, whereas neighbouring properties have been extended significantly over the years, up to 100% uh, in, some of it, in some cases. Uh, we previously submitted an application that has been, has been highlighted to extend the property <coughs> by a similar extent to that. Uh, that application was initially supported by the planning officer and had very strong local support. However, it was ultimately refused due to the absence of a fallback position, as was made clear 
uh, when the original application was considered by the planning committee. As we've now heard, uh, we now established the fallback position through the approval of an initial planning application and a subsequent permitted development application. Our current application seeks to combine these approved schemes into a revised scheme, which is, you've seen is smaller in volume and footprint and is also more advantageous from other perspectives. Less spread across the site, less impactful to the green belt and to neighbours, less impactful when viewed from the road, less disrupted to the local community due to a shorter period of building work. While this is clearly a preferred option and is clearly a better solution in terms of green belt openness and impact on neighbours and the community, we are fully prepared to implement the fallback position if the revised application is ultimately refused. As highlighted, this would be more disruptive and costly, however, we would be left with little choice. We require the space for our family of five, and it is not a cred credible option for us to now sell the property in the current market and with two refused planning applications against it. So to conclude, we've worked hard to follow the correct process, as it was explained to me in the previous slide, the time I was in front of the committee, and to work with the planning officer to agree a scheme which is acceptable to all parties. I believe we have achieved this and respectfully request committee support for the current application. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Right. Next we have Councillor John Horsell, Ward Member. Good evening to you, John. Good evening, sir, and good evening, committee. First of all, I'd like to start with saying that the planning officer has done a very, very good and thorough job and has worked very hard with the applicant to get a scheme which <coughs> could work and would work if the committee accepted it. So I thank you for that. Every so often there is a case where a policy stance we have taken results in an absurdity. And this is one of those occasions. I brought to the committee two years ago Murchiston, which was a similar situation, which the committee agreed with me that it was an absurdity. It is this occasion where the planning committee comes into its own and can apply fair play and common sense. I am, as you know, a green belt warrior to my core, and normally I would find myself sitting on the other side of the argument. But the green belt has to be alive, not a mausoleum. The green belt, belt, belt needs families and children and communities. That's why I favor rural exception. Our policy is if the implication is in excess of 35% of the 1940s footprint, not clear whether this is volume or footprint, then it's by definition inappropriate. The NPPF differs and says, when considering any planning application, local planning authorities should ensure substantial weight is given to any harm to the green belt. And it is the concept of harm and the openness which is the NPPF. Everything else is our own internal policies. <laughs> Very special circumstances will not exist unless the potential harm to the green belt by virtue of a reasonably inappropriateness and any harm resulting from the proposal is clearly outweighed by the considerations. That's what it says to the NPPF, which says very simply in uh, layman's terms, if it is more harmful to apply policy, then we should not. We're looking for harm to the green belt. The resident has approval on our array. He has submitted B, so he can build A. He submitted B and Stefan, the planner, uh, got him to agree to C. It is self-evident to me that C is less harmful to the openness of the green belt. And the planner should be congratulated for doing so. The applicant is happy to enter to any covenants and eradicate any uh, permitted development rights in order to achieve what he wants to achieve. The planning officer agreed, but has been told to be guided uniquely by policy. You must decide whether the openness and permanence of green belt is better served with A or C. It is very clear in my mind it is C, so please support C. It makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. I open it up to members for questions. Who would like to go first? Michelle. 
I agree that C sounds like a better idea. I think just applying policy nilly will uh, really nilly without actually uh, considering what the effects are is insanity. I think sometimes we have to use compassion and we have to use common sense. And I agree that with John that that's a much better idea to see. Anybody else like to uh, speak on this? Well, Angus and then Wayne. This I find confusing, complicated, uh, and not in any way straightforward, uh, asking us to stand on our head in terms of our current policies. Um, my question is, this fallback position is the combination of the two planning applications on page 120, 18421 and 181882. 18421, was that approved by planning officers? Uh, which seems strange seeing we were there to refuse the previous one and now we're back here to consider this one. So that's my first question. So the application that's been approved, I can show you on this image, actually it's probably easier, um, is the side extension. No, it's not what it is, it's who, who approved it? So that side extension was approved under delegated powers. Um, however, that extension on its own amounts to approximately 34% increase in volume. So it is in accordance with policy, which led to that the approval of that specific application. So that, if my figures are right, something like 60 odd percent was added by certificate of lawfulness. This, um, the certificate of lawfulness is not, obviously a permission hasn't been granted. Um, those uh, extensions could be carried out as permitted development in the current situation. Um, when the side extension was approved, um, permitted development rights were restricted. Um, and therefore, if the applicant wishes to carry out the rear extension and the outbuildings under Scheme A, they would need to do that prior to commencing the side extension that's been approved. Because as soon as the side extension is commenced, um, the condition would bite, so to speak, um, and would prevent any, uh, any of those PD schemes going ahead, if that makes sense. Uh, sort of, but what confuses me even more is that you can build more than the green belt policy allows on permitted development. Uh, so I, I really am confused as to the way forward. I fully understand what you're saying. Um, can you just remind me, the 34% side extension, was that on the original volumetrics? So you're base that, basing that, because I, I appreciate somebody said uh, square meter inch, because it's gone from square meter inch to volumetric. I understand over the period it's gone from one to the other. But was that, the first question, was that 34% based on the original footprint? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, in answer to Angus's question, in theory, they've got their 34%, that's it. If they then want to build at the back of the house under PD, which doesn't affect Greenbelt, only conservation areas, Greenbelt, they can, if they want to do that, that's what they, they can do that. They wouldn't be able to in this instance because permitted development rights have been restricted under the permission that's been given for the side extension for the 34%. So as soon as that's commenced, um, the PD rights for this property okay. would drop away. Yeah. Okay. Chris, okay. Am I correct in saying that to implement the fallback position, uh, 181882 has to be developed and then 181421? Must be in that order to avoid losing the yeah, PD related. 
Could you say it again? Sorry. Yeah, it's a, in the table of three, but the last one yeah. has to be done before the middle one to avoid the loss of PT rights. Yes. What table is it? Uh, oh, sorry, page 120. Yeah, the the planning, planning, planning history. Oh, yes. And yeah. 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 the office is suggesting that to do the last one and the middle one is unlikely to be done by the staff correctly. But I can't quite understand why that is. Could you, could you amplify, if I got that, if that is correct, what I just said, could you amplify on why you think that will be difficult to achieve? So, what, what we have to do is assess the, the likelihood of the fallback position being carried out and therefore the way to be attached to it. So in our view, um, it would be impractical to build this, um, the rear extension and all the PDR buildings, completely com um, complete them, um, and then separately build the side extension. So that, that's the view, that's what's led to our recommendation. Okay. Um, could you also explain, what, what is your understanding of the term very special circumstances? And that's, right. it's more, it means, I suppose. So my understanding of the term very special circumstances, um, well, they, there's no definition specifically of very <coughs> special circumstances, but they have to, uh, whatever they are, they need to clearly outweigh any harm to the green belt that's identified. Um, and that is written in the MPPF. Um, a fallback position is is a valid, very special circumstance. So if you were to consider it to be a very special circumstance, then, then that is a valid option. So the argument that we're putting forward here is is what we don't, we only put limited weight on that fallback position. And that's really because you don't think it can sensibly be developed in a way according to the consent. No, and, and a large part, and a good point to make that I don't think I've um, made very clearly is that a large part of the fallback position consists of two relatively large outbuildings in the back garden. Um, and the practicality of relying on them for in volumetric terms um, is also questioned um, in terms of the practicality of whether it's really feasible to live um, across several outbuildings in the plot. Um, that, so that, that also leads to our recommendation. I don't think you mentioned the appeal on page 137, the appeal decision, which is... No, I haven't. So the, the appeal decision that is um, on page 137 um, is not exactly the same situation. Um, however, it is a recent um, example of a very... Um, very similar application um, for a, in this case it was a replacement dwelling um, for, which was over a 35% increase in volume um, and the same argument was gone through by the inspector in this appeal decision um, and the inspector on this occasion questioned the likelihood um, of the fallback position being carried out. Um, partly because of the amount of time that, so this included, um, as far as I understand, certificates of lawfulness that have been granted as well, so a PD pullback position, um, and the inspector questioned how likely they were to be carried out, um, partly because of the length of time since um, those applications have been submitted, um, and then also the practicality um, of, of carrying them out as well. So that there is really um, just to demonstrate that it, the, the argument that's being put forward is valid um, and it has been upheld in the, by inspector, so this decision was um, in August 2018. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm, then John. I'm finding this uh, quite confusing for much and unnecessarily complicated, to be honest. Um, we have the rules about uh, developing the green belt, it has to be uh, special conditions. Um, but to me, development in, a, in Green Belt would be, for instance, building a new house in an area where there wasn't anything before, or building something substantially bigger or uh, a ridiculous sort of layout, um, rather than uh, just a 
a moderate sort of expansion. So I find it, it's quite odd there. In terms of a common sense thing, from what I've seen, the, the new one uh, would be smaller than the, the one for which he's got approval. You said one of the reasons you would have gone for a refusal is that you'd have to do it in a particular order. Uh, to, uh, you may think that's an odd way to do it, but if you wanted to do that, presumably you could. You could do it in the yeah, it's, no, it's, it's not impossible. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. So if he's going to do that and he's, he's happy for it, and the building is smaller than the other one, it's not a brand new building, it's, it's modified, something that's already there. Uh, and to me, common sense is actually doing something that sort of works uh, and is not out of keeping with the others. I understand that there are other developments in the area. So um, I'm personally finding it hard to refuse this, but I'm not quite sure yet. I'm still thinking about it. Okay, John? Yeah, I, I'm slightly confused, uh, sir, I'm confused because according to the planning officer there, if they start the development of the community development, do they have to, you say they have to complete it before they can start the next one? Why is that? If they make a meaningful start, surely that is, the planning is, you know, is operational then? No, so the, the, the conditions attached to the planning application don't come into force until that permission has been commenced. So if they haven't commenced the, permit, the, the extant permission that's on site, those conditions don't apply yet. Um, which is shown by the fact that the certificate of lawfulness was granted after the planning permission was was granted, but it hasn't been commenced, so their their permitted right, development rights are not restricted at the present time. So what you're saying then, if they commence the one at the back, can they then a few months later start this side extension while they're still building the one at the rear? at one and the same time because that you, you just said that commencement is when the application of all of the clauses come into effect so, so the community development says that if you start it you can complete, complete it surely my understanding is that the community development um, schemes would have to be completed before um, commencing the side extension yeah right that's my understanding is that, that might be your understanding, is that legally correct? Can we ask Mary if that is correct? Yeah, so, um, the sort of a plumbing analogy really here yeah, is that once, once it's got to be finished, if you, if you think about it, if you start, so the PD rights are restricted on the 41 application, aren't they? Yes. So, if you start that whilst you're still well, if you start the two applications at the same time, you're going to implement that 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 PD rights restricted one, and you're going to get it's just going to be a mess. It, it can't be. It, it, well, I was asking if they yeah. if they started the community development one first, and then a few months later or six months later started the other one, the one which they got permission for. Can they do that? It, it is a, it is a silliness, really, practically. But you've got to finish. You've got to finish the one as a clean slate before you start the other one. Otherwise, the rules the rules will kick in once you commence it. Do, do I'm probably not explaining it very well. Marcia, can you explain it a bit better than that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's quite clear. In the permitted development one has to be built before the extension is built. Is that obviously you can quote the uh, relevant rules and laws that say that that is the way it should work, yes? Yeah. I don't have any of that. But you can find them for you. I feel that uh, it seems to me that this could be built. They could do the permitted one first, then do the other one afterwards. I can't see a problem with it. Carl. Thanks. Um, well, I, I've read my read this one quite a lot, I read a bit about it, and uh, until 10 minutes ago I thought I had a handle on it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm as confused as everybody else. Um, it, it is a bit of a, it's like one of those, is it Isha diagrams where the steps keep going up, no matter which way you look at it, it's kind of going around in circles. Um, I guess the first thing I, I kind of, when I was thinking about this, is, is looking at the MPPF. Um, uh, that basically says, Inappropriate development, definitely not in the green belt, 
except for very, very special circumstances. Um, and then it says, very special circumstances will not exist unless the potential harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness is clearly outweighed by other considerations. So I think it, it's definite. It, well, if then you go to 145C, which basically <coughs> says uh, an exception to um, these rules are the extension of a, or alteration of a building provided that it does not result in disproportionate additions over and above the size of the original building. Clearly, it falls foul of that. It, it's definitely much bigger than the building, so it does fall foul of inappropriate development. So then we're left with, is it very special circumstances? And that's kind of as far as I've got in terms of understanding. Um, I'm not quite sure what the very special circumstances could be, would be. Um, I take the point that's been made about, if you look at the, these, these pictures here, which are very good, laid out very nicely, the, what's already approved is worse in terms of the green map, um, by definition. Um, is that very special circumstances? I don't know. Um, one thing I would say, so I, I, let me ask that as a question, is that very special circumstances? What are they? I think somebody's asked it already. I'm not sure we've got an answer, really. I'm not sure we'll ever get one. Um, but another thing is, if we do end up approving this, I think without doubt there would need to be a condition to stop permitted development again on top just like the previous one because um, we wouldn't want to be in a position where C was built and then the outbuildings in A turned up so uh, I think that's just an important point to make but I imagine that was already on the agenda um, so yeah so what what's very special conditions really would like to come back on that so the the fallback scheme does constitute very special circumstances which would which could justify the approval of the application. The question for the decision maker is how likely is the fallback position to occur. So it does this does consist of very special circumstances. Okay. So the point that these outbuildings would be as I just said, damaging, more damaging to the green belt in the scheme in C is a very special circumstance. But it's a question then of applying the weight of would it be built. And, and I guess the question I would ask then is if it's been approved already, or part of it's been approved in the rest of the committee's development, why has it not already been built? So there's a bit of a, again, we're into another, another circle of, and I, I don't know where the, the terminus is on that. Okay. Uh, so. I'm going to go to page one, two, four. So the original house is 289 cubic meters. So what they've got permission for is 34 percent of that, roughly. Yes. Right. Um, but what they're asking for is 650, 645 cubic meters. 627. 600. I've updated that in the moment. Oh, sorry. So 627. Of course, that is a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly. So, so, that, holds you to it. so that includes the outbuilding. Um, I don't know what the figure is, including the outbuilding, but which is quite small. But for the extension, it's 102 percent. Right, so of that 289, the, the original building, how much of that in, was a, how much of that was the outbuilding? Do you know? Or wasn't there an outbuilding? In? There wasn't an outbuilding. There's an outbuilding proposed in this application. Okay. So it's and we would we wouldn't include the outbuilding if there was one in the way, it would just be for the house. So it's up roughly 102 percent increase. So for the extension, it's 102 percent, um, and then I don't have the exact figure for the small outbuilding, but the, the, the plan is in front of you. Um, so it would be a little bit more than. The amphitheater doesn't include the new buildings. Sorry, 
Okay, John, did you yeah, I was going to say that according to this document, it says the existing house plus extension plus and including the outbuildings is 627, so it's included in that figure. That's what it says here. Yeah, yeah. it is in that figure. But um, you don't know how big it is to take it out? Um, not the outbuilding, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, is that a figure that you really need to know? To no, no, no. I, I do have the figure, the volume figure for the outbuilding. I don't know what it is as a percentage, but the outbuilding is 36 square me, uh, cubic metres. Right, members, are on oh, Chris. <coughs> I think the uh, positioners, I think we all agree that uh, were it not for the, for the two um, applications to consents, we would be refusing this because it's too great an increase in volume in itself. So it's all on the fallback position. And we've heard because they do have to be done in a certain order, otherwise there's no consent in the opposite way, um, that would be very difficult to do and unlikely to be carried out. That's the advice we're getting. Therefore, that knocks the fallback position. This can only be approved if we accept the fallback position is going to be built. And I don't believe they have the consent to do it in a sensible way. Michelle? They actually do if they do one, one part of the lawful distance, the uh, little out, the outbuildings first, and then do it. That's already approved like that. It doesn't mean they have to. It's the only way they can do it. Legally, they can do it that way. This is actually a smaller footprint total than the approval that they already have. So ergo, it should be better for the green belt since it's smaller, about 55 cubic meters smaller. So therefore, it makes sense to actually approve this rather than making them go through a, a long involved thing of having outbuildings and site extensions. It's silly after a while. We're, be, we're being pedantic to try to do something to pickle uh, the green belt aspect and you can't do anything with it. To, to add that to Michelle, you also have to consider those outbuildings, whether they would actually be, are, are they going to be of use to actually live in? Would you actually want an outbuilding right down at the bottom of the garden? I don't know what it's going to be used for, what is proposed, but it's clearly not the same as having all of the building all together. I think putting teenagers in an outbuilding would probably be a great idea. <laughs> John? Yeah. I always thought what I was told was we have to go with the facts we've got in front of us. The facts we have in front of us are that they have permission to build permitted development at the back and a side extension. If they do it in a particular order, it can be built 100%. I'm not too sure that we should be making decisions as to whether it will or won't be built. I also don't think we should make decisions as to whether they would live in it or not. I don't think that's down to us. They have got the approval, they can build it if they want, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. So I think we have to consider whether what's being proposed now is better for the green belt than what could be there if we do nothing and turn it down today. Yeah. No, yeah. That's completely wrong. We, we are here to determine whether we think we're going to, they're going to build it. No, I said That's the point. Quite yes. opposite no. what we said. Calm. Yeah, so I'm not saying I agree with Chris, but I think his, his logic of uh, the steps we're taking is, is, is right. Um, my, my view is kind of, you know, on balance, the, this application is better in terms of the green belt. But there's a big caveat on that. I worry about the setting of a precedent in this kind of area. You know, the, 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 I mean, this is a massive increase, you know, the volume is huge. Uh, you know, and, and I worry about that. And uh, I guess that's a question. Maybe. Are we setting some kind of precedent? Um, will there be other people who say, "All oh, right, I can get I can get my volume up by 102 percent. All I have to do is apply for this, that, and the other. It will fail, or I'll get through on 34 percent, and then I'll go back and say, "Oh, I'm going to put a big outbuilding in there." And before we know it, everybody, you know, everybody in the row is doing the same thing. So, not implying that's what's happening here. Just to say, just you know. Other people may look at this and, and look at it as a way forward. So I still don't know. 
as that was a policy statement, could you just pass the comment on that, please? Whether it's a precedent? Um, yes, it would set a precedent. And the thing is, the, um, the certificate application shows, us, shows an outbuilding. The permitted development rights would enable the applicant to cover half his back garden. He hasn't shown that in the certificate, but he could have done. That would also be lawful. Michelle, is there a new point because um, I don't want to go around in circles for too long? Well, not really in circles, but the thing is, he already had, he was already told that if his fallback position was bigger than the proposal here, that would be legal. That would be legal and it would be okay. So why are we, you know, you're saying setting a precedent. It's already a precedent. There isn't anything. It's already policy from that standpoint. Yeah, please, Michelle. The, the issue is how likely is somebody to build one or more than one outbuildings in that back garden. And when you look at the appeal decision, for a very for a nearby site, the inspector has said he doesn't feel that um, the the appellant in that case would have built the full back position. It so can. Yes. There's nothing we can do to stop them from doing the full back position. Nothing at all. We're trying to assess so, what they will. That's not the point. Well, the thing is, it doesn't matter whether we want or not, we're doing something that's on balance better because it's less space. Well, to put your microphone space. on, so you touch that again. Okay, it's less space overall. It's 55 cubic meters less than the fallback position, so therefore it would be less of an effect on the green belt, at least from my standpoint. If we don't think they're going to build it, and we refuse this, nothing gets built. No, it's the best solution. They'll build it. Right? This, in any way, we don't, this is too big for the Green Belt. So that's the ideal position to refuse it if we believe that it, the alternative will not be built. We don't know it will. We have to assess it. Yeah, I don't want to sort of go into it and throw it between members. Is this a new comment, Carl? Yeah, just a new comment. Uh, all right, maybe not. I'll go to the just the yeah, fact that, you know, in terms of Green Belt, it's not just the volumetric side yeah. of it. That is, that is a point. Yeah. But it's about um, cramp, not cramping the space. Kind of wording, it's about kind of keeping the space open. It's putting extra buildings in a back garden, which in this case is a permitted development. It, it's, it's, it's a downside for the green belt as well. We obviously have to measure the weight of that compared to the rest. Well, then, John, yeah. uh, have they exhausted the amount of permitted development they can do with this uh, the approval which they got? Or could they put more buildings in the back garden, more larger buildings or bigger buildings? Or have they now stopped, they can't do any more? They could put larger outbuildings in the garden. And if you approve this extension tonight, they could build those bigger outbuildings and then go on and build the extension. Can we remove them? Right. Can we remove if, if we did approve this, couldn't we actually, by condition, stop any further PD going onto it? Would that be a condition we could apply? The condition wouldn't bite. The condition wouldn't bite until the planning commission is implemented. So they could build all the outbuildings before commencing the planning commission. So they could lawfully build all the outbuildings and then implement the planning commission. That presupposes it's a very complex. <laughs> arrangement of trying to cheat everywhere. At the end of the day, day, it is a smaller <laughs> building. We're not building a new one. It is smaller. And that would be to me a smaller building is more attractive and appropriate, it seems. You know, common sense. Makes sense. Uh, <coughs> okay. Just ask you to make. But I don't think that the building is smaller than what's already. Well, smaller than the one he's got permission to do. Yeah. Yes, right here. He's got permission to build a big one. According to the things. The extension that's being proposed is larger than the extensions to the house which could be built under permitted development. Yes. So the PD extension and the approved extension amount to about 79% increase in volume. This extension amounts to about 102% increase in volume. Um, so the volume that's being relied upon is largely um, to, to which makes the PD fallback position larger than the current proposal largely comes from the outbuildings. If that makes sense. Sort of, I think. But, uh, 
from what I was asking before, it might seem an odd way to go about it, but if you wanted to do it, assuming you're not there to cheat, assuming you wanted to build it in a, in a different sequence in order to achieve it, would he be permitted to? We can't presuppose on his behalf that he's not going to build it or he's going to build three times the size. If he wanted to build it in a different sequence, even if it cost him more, would, would he be allowed? And the answer, I think, was yes. There's nothing legally to stop that happening, um, but the, the, the argument that we're putting forward is that it's unlikely to happen, um, and therefore we've attached limited weight to that fallback position. And, and Malcolm, just to reiterate what Mark Marshy said, if we were to permit this, we could propose that we could go and build in the back garden tomorrow morning and before implementing what we approved tonight, if we were to approve it. Well, so if you had that condition, your question was, but you not hear it from it? Put your microphone on, please. Yeah. My question was, uh, by condition, could you prevent that happening as an additional? Or are you saying it's got to go through that loop first? Once, if we were to approve it, once that application had been started, that could stop anything else being put in yes. the back garden. But before the applicant started building it, they could put things that were allowed in the back garden by community <coughs> development. And then you'd end up, say, a similar situation we are now. Yeah, so this is going to be the last comment. So, it, can we um, have a legal agreement <coughs> saying that the permission will be granted if they agree to um, stop all permitted development rights now before the approval is made? The applicant could have put in a unilateral undertaking to assure you that that would be the case. Is he willing to do that? We don't have it. Well, is he willing to do that? Perhaps we have an answer for that. No. He could have submitted one with the application, but he's chosen not to. That's not actually true. God, if you just like, if you just come forward, I don't normally let people come forward again, but if you come and just explain this, and then we're going to go to the vote. We were discussing this application with the case officer. We discussed the point of, which has been raised Press by members. Sorry. We discussed the point of being raised by members about not being able to restrict the permitted development rights. And we said to the case officer, and this was the basis upon which it was being recommended for approval at the time, that we'd enter into a legal agreement which precluded the, the ability to build anything before this scheme was implemented. Yeah. So <coughs> exactly the circumstances that you described there um, is, is, is what we already discussed. So it was moving forward. My clients had already agreed to pay a thousand pounds towards the legal fees. Um, the planning <coughs> officer had put it through on that basis and we were expecting a planning permission on that basis before there was a change of um, tack from the senior management, which undermined the office tack. Michelle? Can we, then, if we pass this, can we put a condition on it that says that they will enter into a, into this legal agreement restricting the PD rights? Uh, with the restriction they have to do that, if otherwise they will put it on. Can we put it a condition on them, since they're willing to do so, that they will restrict, they will go into a, a unilateral legal agreement that says they will not do any more PD rights at all, they give up all the PD rights, providing this happens. And within a certain amount of time, otherwise the thing will expire. And is yours on the same way? Very much so. Yeah. That would then give us the question to approve a development over 100% greater than that is currently there. Can we move to the boat? Okay. Well, Martin, you can come back there. Uh, we'd like you to answer that question, and then we will go to the boat. If you if you are wanting to approve it, we can we can um, ask for a um, union action or legal agreement. Or if Good. Oh, no, I think we've had enough. Just show. one possibility. Yeah. If we defer this and let you sign the agreement, then bring it back to the next month, would that work? That way it would eliminate all the... Uh, Can we just take a vote? Mm -hmm. Mary's going to give some advice here. So I just want to give, give a, 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 an easier way of doing this, okay. which is simply to grant, if you are minded to grant permission, 
subject to conditions and to unilateral that's satisfactory or was delegated to the yes. to the yeah. um, to Marcia um, it, it, that it's satisfactory to her. So you, you delegate the final. Is that right, Marcia? Is, is that yes. yes, that's fine. If that's what they're minded, that's to, what do. They're minded to do. That's what they're minded to do. That's fine. Rather than bring it back, yeah. put a condition on it. It seems easier to do it that way. Yes, that would be. But you indicated then, Angus. Chairman, to try and make business, can we put the, uh, the uh, recommendation as in the agenda I propose? Okay, we will go to the, the vote on it. <coughs> the recommendation then is set out on page 119 to refuse. The reasons for it. Are written there. All those in favour of refusing the application, please show. So we have one, two, three, four. All those in favour, or <laughs> go the other way. Yeah, go the other way. So we have four. So that's four all. I do know that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have the casting vote. Then is the chair. For as long as I've been on the committee, which is a very long time, the chair has always voted with the officer's recommendation, and I propose to do that in this case. So that application is refused. Agenda item 84 on page 143. So it's the application to vary condition three of the plan application consent 181565. This condition refers to the hours of operation. Before the committees, the condition was required by members on the 10th of the 10th of 18. And we did have a site visit for that application. And the bit of why I've just introduced it, but I want to say that the ward members and myself and Councillor Ross, as he put the Condition, he put forward that condition um, last time. We're invited to a briefing which was led by officers last week. Okay, um, I'm now going to hand over to Chris to chair it from now on. Okay, thank you very much. So, Sentry T. Hello. Hello. Hi. Off you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, as you understand, this application is for the variation of condition three, hours of operation of honey consent 181565. In addition to that, it is necessary to vary condition five of original permission to facilitate the variation of condition three. So condition five will now read, I'll come back to that while we are posing that. So the condition five will now read, Prior to the first use of the approved sports pitch, a noise management scheme shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority, which specifies the provisions to be made for the control of noise emanating from the approved development. 
and an informative is included with this condition that gives details required for the noise management plan. So just a quick recap. So this shows the location of the proposed pitch. The pitch would be located between residential properties along Clifton Road to the east and Embrook Road to the west. The main issues associated with the application are the pitch is intended to be used for football and rugby at both competitive and recreational levels and the funding authority requires confirmation that the pitch would be available until 2200 hours Monday to Friday during the football season. The original condition 3 allowed operating hours up to 2200 hours Monday to Friday, however, with the condition that should the noise management plans and appraisals not be submitted to the satisfaction of the local planning authority, then the development, including flood lighting, shall be restricted to 730 to 2000 hours Monday to Friday and 800 to 2000 hours again on weekends and bank holidays. Now, shorter op operating hours wouldn't be viable from a funding perspective. Therefore, this application seeks to permanently retain the ag agreed hours of operation until 2200 hours from the weekdays. So, to support this application, an updated noise impact assessment has been submitted that provides a more reliable predicted noise levels coming from the pitch. So the during original application, noise data from two pitches in Bristol were used to predict noise level at Embrook. And at that point of time, it was the questions were raised why uh, noise data from Bristol were used. So the updated report, amongst other details, includes noise data from similar pitches within 20 miles of the application site. So one from Arborfield Green Leisure Center, which is within Algora, and the other from Vine School in Basingstoke. Moreover, a site noise survey is included that was undertaken between half four in the afternoon until midnight to determine the general noise climate of that area. So these additional information are used to create a computerized model of expected noise levels coming from Embrook School. Before I get into the noise model, here quick uh, information. But this new data collected from these two nearby pitches showed that in one instance we had a very high noise level of 60 decibel at about 10 meters behind the goal line and as you can see in these cases the houses are directly behind the goal lines mm. on the east it's 55.5 meters and to the west 61.5 meters so these information are used to produce an expected noise model this as you can see most of these residential gardens come under dark green zone, which is a noise level of between 45 to 50 decibels, which are expected uh, acceptable outdoor uh, noise levels according to World Health Organization for daytime use. And since this pitch is proposed to be used between 7.30 in the morning to 10 o'clock in the night, which is according to um, the government guidance was within daytime uh, uh, zone. So I, it is acceptable, the levels that they are showing. However, with use of the 60 decibel behind 10 meters uh, of the goalpost, we have seen one instance of yellow. That zone, so where it is expected that a noise level of 51 decibels, uh, one meter from the facade of that one particular dwelling. So this is a table which shows the noise levels which are acceptable by World Health Organization and comparing that with our expected noise levels. So for the outdoor livings, the daytime expected acceptable noise levels up to 50 decibel. We are between 45 to 50 in this instance. And for the indoors, it's 35, and we are getting 30 to 35. However, there is one worst case scenario of 51 decibels as I described before. Now with effective noise management and mitigation measures, 
This predicted noise at the facade of the neighboring properties generally can be maintained less than 50 decibel. Noise management formed part of the original condition four and five. These conditions are retained, included, including a rewarded condition five. This is to ensure more effective and enforceable condition is included to alleviate noise concerns raised by both members and neighbors at the time of original application. So, the wordings of these proposed conditions are, the condition three hours of operation will retain only the permitted hours, which are suggested as 7.30 to 2200 Monday to Friday, and 800 to 2000 weekends and bank holidays. Uh, original condition included other clauses, which have been uh, supposed to be removed from that. And the noise mitigation condition number two has been cut down to be more precise. So this says that prior to the first use of the approved sports pitch, a noise management scheme shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority, which specifies the provisions to be made for the control and mitigation of noise emanating from the approved development. Now the question is, what kind of details are we looking for in a noise management plan? So the informative one is recommended, which would include the details that we are looking for. So we are looking for noise monitoring supervisor, a code of conduct for the users of the pitch, a mechanism to report and investigate noise complaints, a mechanism for reviewing and updating noise mitigation measures following receipt of substantiated complaints, liaison with uh, stakeholders and interested parties, the applicant is informed that the planning committee chair and Embroke board councillors will be consulted prior to approval of details pursuant to condition five. So um, the applicant has suggested a model for noise management plan, which starts with reporting, going to the investigation, and then resolving. However, they haven't provided much details. This needs to be secured to ensure that the noise management and mitigation plans completely in order. In terms of member updates and five updates, the most important of them is the amended condition five and implementing one. And addition of appendix one, which includes the minutes from the committee meeting on um, 10th of October 2018, agenda item 43. So based on the evidences provided in the updated noise report, it is considered that operating hours of 7.30 to 2200, Monday to Friday, and 800 to 2200 weekends and bank holidays wouldn't result in additional noise disturbances. An effective noise management plan can address the worst case scenario as identified in the report. In re it is hence recommended that the committee authorizes the head of development management to grant planning permission subject to conditions within the report and on the subject. Thank you. Um, can I just add on condition five, and I'm sorry, I should have spotted this earlier. At the end of the condition, it then needs to say, the pitch shall only be used in strict accordance with the approved scheme. Thank you very much. Um, so, a couple of speakers. Um, first of all, Craig Humber for a member of school, please. Apologies about my time. Okay. So, long school, as you can see. Okay, thank you. Um, so from a school's point of view, um, I'm sure you're aware of a couple of local secondary schools um, falling pupil admission numbers. Um, and one of the things that the, this project will obviously boost will be um, the attractiveness to current stu or new students or additional students in, in current years um, 8 to 11. Um, because um, we have other neighbouring schools that have a much better facility with regards to um, not necessarily asteroids, but certainly areas, because I'm sure you're aware that the Brook um, Oh, sorry, all of the, the school is further in the past. Um, that's now been ish, uh, rectified, but the, the, water, the actual grass area on the, in the school still is very boggy. And for six months of the year, actually, 
it's very unreliable to use the pitch, um, which, which impacts lessons. Um, so obviously with the improved facilities um, and therefore rising PAN numbers, the, um, the student will get more, the school will get more funding, sorry. Um, the improved facilities will also attract, starting with the Astro, uh, better teaching um, practitioners. Um, it will allow staff to then access better health and uh, exercise facilities to improve their own health and well-being. Um, it will also have links to current primary schools, which are very difficult to do at the moment, simply because of, as I, as I mentioned, the, the space outside. Um, it will allow the Embrick to then sort of host tournaments with the local feeder schools um, in all weathers. Um, um, as I said, for specific months of the year, it's, it's very inconsistent. Um, it will improve the um, lesson consistency um, and quality of um, outdoor lessons um, for Key Stage 3, Key Stage and Key Stage 4. Um, it also improve the extracurricular provision that we can provide for students and also increase the number of um, sports that we're able to deliver outside. Um, it will make the school uh, a hub of the community, sort of bringing in um, uh, lots of different sporting teams we can then link the students to as well. Um, and, excuse me, um, and it will obviously lead to then improved student outcomes um, and progress um, across um, all the different uh, quality of uh, options we offer at Key 4 and Key 6 5. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And the last speaker for the evening, Councillor Curtin. Okay. Harry Clark, Pembroke, member. So, the Embrook 3G project presents a wonderful opportunity for the local football community of Wokingham and the Embrook School to enjoy access to a modern and impressive 3G football site. And I am committed to supporting the project and I'm dedicated to alleviate any reservations that local residents may have. The two key partner clubs, Wokingham and Embrook Football Club and Ashridge Park Football Club, will use the site to provide training for their teams. The 3G site will also provide a safe and high quality surface for young footballers and older players to enjoy their activity and provide the massive benefits to the local community. The 3G site will be a huge asset for the school in terms of attracting new prospective students and be a fantastic venue for hosting school fixtures and enhancing the school's physical education curriculum. Walking Board Council and Places Leisure, who will help manage the site, will employ strong management strategies to ensure that the site not only benefit users, but does not impact on local residents. The timings of the opening and closing of the site are pivotal to secure the funding necessary for the project. The site has a full program of usage from Monday to Friday up to 10 p.m. and the funders, the Football Foundation, have advised us that by reducing the hours of usage, this will have a financial impact and affect the business case for the football development plan. They will not be able to fund the project unless the timing restrictions are removed. It is therefore imperative that this project receives the full support of this committee to allow the site to function up to 10 p.m. during the week. The site will close in the early evening at weekends and bank holidays. So to maintain a strong management approach, all partner clubs and hires of the pitch will have to sign a contract that includes a code of conduct covering usage and behavior on site. The Embrick School, Places Leisure and Walking and Borough Council will be vigilant that this code of conduct is adhered to. The site management will follow a stringent model of monetary noise and the effect of usage on the local residents and any complaints can be made by an online system that will be flagged to the management of the site. Notices will be put up in the car park area asking people to leave quietly and the management of the site will have the power to remove offenders who disrespect the site and the local area as a result of <coughs> loud noise, persistent swearing and leaving the site inappropriately. Other measures to mitigate noise levels which are possible and will be reviewed include acoustic barriers to be built outside the boundary fence, as well as the use of padding on boundary fencing. And as you know, members, our council is committed to supporting physical activities among our residents, 
So I urge the committee to support this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, perhaps if I'll just mention um, things such as acoustic barriers, I don't know, are they in the application? They're not part of this application, but it has been suggested by the applicant that this can be used later on if we receive complaints and as part of the noise mitigation measures. So it would it be possible to put these in as conditions? Uh, not at this moment, uh, I'd say, because uh, we haven't seen the actual noise management plan. So if that's included in the noise management plan, we can approve it to later stage. Separate application. Thank you very much. Members. Wayne and then Rochelle. Yes, I'm, I fully supported this the last time. And I, I think I agree with all what's been said, uh, the teacher and the liquor in that you know, we need more of these across the borough so that children can play football throughout the year instead of when we get a slight bit of rain, that you know, they're out of use. Um, and I think what you've done, Shinjuti, um, it's very thorough what you've done and the mitigation plans of what you've suggested sounds brilliant to me, so I think I, I will fully support it. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Okay, a couple of questions. First of all, is the noise in the other areas the same distance to houses I'm talking about Arbor Field and Basingstoke as uh, in New York. Next of all, the external, uh, there's going to be an external management scheme for the evenings. It's not going to be controlled by the school. So how will we actually have any kind of influence on these external managers to actually do anything? Last, the pitch is only going to be used during the day for the school, they said, not at night. So it isn't actually relevant whether they play at night or not. Uh, because the, the children won't be playing at night, the school will be using it at night, it's going to be used elsewhere. And doesn't the Ember Walking Football Club already have a pitch with approval to, to do night uh, practices in Embrook in another location, right on Old Forest Road in the corner of Loudler? That was an application we approved in the past. And how would that, the fact that if they leave there, how will that affect the location that they're presently using? So would that mean they would eliminate that when we build houses on there or something? And lastly, how are we going to stop cheering a football chance when people are actually playing football if they actually are excited by it? Um, I'm sorry, having to actually keep them uh, quiet. Have you been near any football field when the people score and yell goal or whatever they do? Uh, they are very loud. And that would annoy the local residents considerably. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, just on the land, we have, of course, approved the previous application. So we're, we're, we're just looking at noise. I know that. Which you, you raised the value points. These are all noise yeah, things. Yeah, that was just And the base ship is going to be an external management, which, which we yeah, don't know yeah, about. Yeah, the questions are fine. Just, um, I'm just reminding members. Could you answer the questions, please? Um. I'll try to answer the questions as I have understood them, but please okay. correct me if I'm wrong in understanding the questions. So regarding the noise levels at um, Arborfield Green and Pine School, the noise levels were not measured from the residential properties, but measured at 10 meters behind the goal line. How so, far, okay. so how from far that, are the residential properties from these places? That, that, is, uh, that was not checked because using that data, 10 meters behind the goal line, and the residential properties in Embrook site being 55.5 meters to the east and 61.5 meters to the west, a computerized model was created. So the data source, the noise source was 10 meters behind the goal line from both sides. And then if the residential dwelling is so 45 and a half meters from the noise source in one direction, and um, 51.5 meters in another direction, how the noise would then behave. That's what the noise model tried to create. So does that answer to your question? Were you not referring to the, uh, the background <coughs> level noise different? The the noise, noise. Noise, and how close they are to the things and whether they have had complaints about the noise in those areas? Because... Who's going for 
whether they've had complaints about the noise in the area, because I do know that there were some problems with the Amber uh, Walking Football Club noise previously in another application. So I'm just saying that. We, I don't think I have that information with me at this moment, and that was not, I don't think it was looked into it in this noise report. Uh, okay, the external, yeah. the external only, management uh, scheme for the evening. So the external management is part of the noise management plan which we are yet to actually see. So as they have recommended, it's a process mm -hmm. of first reporting the noise complaints, then assessing the complaints, and then finally resolving it. Each component of that needs to be detailed out by the applicants uh, within, before, prior to the first use. So we will be receiving another application hopefully soon to finalize that and we can get more details about this <coughs> stage. Should we actually be approving anything that we don't know what the agreement is or the noise management scheme is? Mm -hmm. We're approving something, but if we approve something and we don't know what the scheme is, what are we approving? Okay, next thing. Uh, the pitch is only used to... Jack, pick up the back of the clip here. We should have the noise management scheme now if we're looking at it to approve this rather than trying to approve something and then have a scheme afterwards which may or may not work we'd like to know what the scheme is. The condition requires the noise, ma noise management plan to be finalized before the first use. So even if we approve the timing they can't use that page until 10 o'clock unless we have the noise management plan approved first. Pitch used only during the day for the school, not at night, so why would this affect the school's uh, attractiveness? I'm not the right person, perhaps, to answer to that question. Well, that's not a matter of noise, is it? What? That is a matter of noise. Well, you said that this is one of the reasons we want to do this, is because they said that it would be make the school more attractive. That was one of the reasons that hmm. the school people said. Yeah, it's the whole application. Well, no, that's what they just said now hmm. to yeah. us. Well, yeah, we don't know. That's a general point that we've already approved. Yeah. We've got yeah. the result yeah. detriment of the application. Yeah. Yeah. Approved. Yeah. 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 Well, we're trying to approve a change to the application. We're trying to approve a change to the application, change to the laws. If they don't get the funding, don't get the funding, they won't be able to use it at all during the day because yeah. they won't get a pitch. Yeah, exactly. yes. No, I wasn't saying Oh, no, I wasn't saying anybody. Is anybody else? No, Angus is next. Oh, sorry. Uh, Angus is next. Just that one. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I think we've answered that one, but uh, unless there's a pitch, then the school will can't benefit. And if we don't agree a later timing, we've heard that the pitch will not be viable. So I think, I think if my friend is listening, uh, that is the answer to her question. Uh, equally, she mentions about um, the football clubs. Uh, each club has dozens of teams, so it's not a matter of each club wanting one uh, um, AOP. Uh, we could build six or seven more, I guess, and they'd all get used fully. So, so that's not the question. Just a point of uh, accuracy, I think your uh, comparison was talking about Raj Green, not Arborfield Green, but uh, the actual figures all relate to it. As I see it, what has been done since we last considered this is uh, a much tighter um, noise impact assessment, uh, which shows that theoretically uh, we are well within the bounds uh, but this would obviously need to have real life trial, which is why we've got this backstop, as it were, of the interest of the backstop. Is it a backstop forever, or is it just for a short amount of time? Well, it's not a purpose. I know, I'm trying to give it on. I thought that might be um, So, to me, uh, I think we've given a lot of reassurance to all parties and hopefully to the members of this committee uh, that we have a far more robust uh, scheme to ensure that this 
great benefit to the community, can be provided, can be provided safely, and, and that we can be reassured that if there are issues, then we have um, the panels. I won't use that B word again. Um, in addition, there's the code of conduct, which of course the football clubs will need to sign up to, and I'm sure they uh, won't be playing matches at 10 o'clock at night, they'll be just training uh, at that time, uh, and will not want to lose that facility, uh, and I'm sure there will be very strong pressure from those running those clubs to ensure that we meet the reasonable standards to stop any undue inconvenience to the neighbours. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Yes. I want to thank very much like my colleagues to seated on here. Uh, I liked this scheme uh, previously and I voted in favour of it. Um, since then we've gone uh, with a much better uh, quality of check on, on the noise. I think the report is very detailed and very clearly presented. Uh, I think it's an excellent scheme and I will be voting in favour of this. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Right, so we all think the pictures are great ugly. We know that we passed it, passed that. Uh, and it was a minor kind of condition change really, which was about worries about the noise. I think it was, we were looking at, I remember seeing all the other pictures in the borough, and what times they operate at, not all of them at 10 o'clock, I think the majority of them. I think that was the idea that we would kind of reduce it down and then it was thought, well, it needs to go to 10 o'clock. So let's have this condition that would if the noise was a problem, this would deal with it. Um, the first thing I just want to say about this application is I think it would be really good whenever a condition is being varied, if the actual previous condition was there, a facsimile of, and the new condition, so that we can compare and contrast. I don't think that's it. Um, it explains it, but it doesn't, it doesn't literally have a copy of how the original condition was. In the members' update, the, um, the appendix one, which lists the minutes from that, basically refers to it as um, an hours of operation management plan. It doesn't say anything else other than that. So that doesn't tell us what specifically was on that condition. Uh, I think that condition was written after the event, event so you know, obviously we'd have to see that. But anyway, um, I just want to make a slight point that around the thing of if we refuse this, it will not happen. We aren't restricting the hours, and we weren't restricting the hours the first time. The noise would have restricted the hours if it occurred. So it wasn't like we uh, are in a position where you know, we're changing something we have to change. If we, if we didn't change this, it would still be 10 o'clock on the basis of the noise is a problem, then it wouldn't be. And on that subject, I just looking in the members update on that appendix with the minutes from last time, there's a point about um, so say here, Kate Powell, environmental health, confirmed that noise levels have been compared, not sure, makes no sense really, have been compared against 35 decibels and she was satisfied that levels would not be unacceptable. I don't know what that means, but does it mean the noise levels were expected to be 35 decibels as a maximum or what that meant? But we do know from, from this application, in the applicant's, is it the applicant's points? We said about the, uh, it being 1 dB above the WHO minimum at one small site, as you point out. Um, that's, that's 51 decibels, so I don't know whether I don't know if I've got an argument here to make that point, but it seems to me that that looks like it's noisier. The model says it's going to be noisier than was originally thought. So that's just something that we can consider. Uh, consider. Uh, and then this talk here about the people who've done the model in the report have said, that can be controlled using this barrier. So my, my thing will be saying, why is there a barrier, not a barrier here then? Why have we not done that already? Um, you know, why, I, mean, I guess so what I'm saying is, I, I don't see why we can't have some form of condition that says, if this happens, the barrier shall happen. Obviously that, that, that goes to the, the applicant and says they have to build it. Um, but anyway, that, that, yeah. in the end, it just seems to me a bit of cake and eat it here. It's like, oh yeah, the noise is quite high in one place uh, and we can solve it by doing X, but we're not going to do X. <laughs> so it just seems a bit of a, another circular kind of one. But, um, but in the end, you know, I'm not going to vote the pitch down because of that. But yeah, I think the barrier should, should be in there. Joe, yes, would you like to speak Joe, please? Hello, you are. My name is Joe, I'm part of the health. Um, 
just want to pick up on the 35 dB. It's, um, that level is the general recognised level within living rooms. Um, oh. Oh. And I think there may be some confusion. Yeah, yeah, I I say, I mean, 50 dB is the WHO limit, uh, which is external. Okay. Right. So that's not relevant. Right. Thank you. Uh, I think we take on board what you said about um, putting previous conditions in similar circumstances. With the, the previous conditions here. Previous areas and things like We've got a description of it, but it's good. Yeah. I mean the actual condition as it's written here is the replacement one. Yeah. It would be nice to have the original one as it was. <laughs> we, we can pick that up. It's not 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 not It's 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 not which is not uh, included <coughs> in the current application. So we can include that condition for the next application which we're expecting with the noise management plan. So the details, once the applicants provide us with the details of the noise management plan, we can condition that. If we receive substantial complaints from the neighbors and that the noise levels following receiving, once we receive the complaints and the noise monitoring officer actually measures the noise to be more than 50 decibels, then we can go for the uh, acoustic barrier. So that can be conditioned at a later stage. Okay. But at this, see, because this application doesn't include any details for the noise management in this moment. So. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Rochelle? Define substantial complaints. That's a vague, that's a vague comment. Uh, you know, are we talking about two? Are we talking about ten? We're talking about a hundred. What's substantial? I'm sorry, it's my fault. I meant substantiated. So once we receive a complaint, maybe the noise decibel uh, felt by the neighbors could be only 40 decibel, but they thought that it was really noisy. So once we receive a complaint, the a noise um, monitoring manager would visit the site with the noise uh, monitoring machine and actually check what's the noise level there. And if it is more than 50 decibels, then we would insist on having the three meter acoustic barrier. Okay, I guess. Well, my, my understanding is that what we're asking for is an effective noise management plan. And if there are complaints at that first, paying off service, um, described, then we would need to, to make sure how that effective noise management plan could be reinstated. That might be an acoustic panel, it might be other things. Um, I, I don't see that we should tie down the possible uh, expense of, of, of um, acoustic panels. I don't think that's our job as a planning committee. I think our, our job is to ensure there's an effective noise management plan and system in place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if nobody else wishes to speak, um, um, uh, I've got a spelling mistake here in, the, in, noise, in noise mitigation 2, paragraph 5. I don't know whether it's corrected. Corrected. Is it, is it corrected? Right, okay. Did you just want to read out your, what you said at the beginning last time? We just need to add a sentence onto the end of um, condition five to say the pitch shall only be used in strict accordance with the approved scheme. Okay, I think that's fairly uh, uh, uncontroversial. So um, we'll go to the vote. Um, the recommendation is somewhere around at well, the top of page 144 with um, modified conditions in the members' update. So those in favour of approving, please show. Uh, those against? And I, haven't seen you the, I, I haven't seen the noise management plan, so I can't vote on something I don't know. Okay. Well, members, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody out there.